Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today with the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity as we continue our college campus outreach events and webinars across the state of Michigan. Today, we're visiting with uh, Grand Valley State University, home of the Lakers, uh, and going to talk about some of the challenges, opportunities, and things that you need to be doing as you're thinking about being open as colleges resume in-person in -person life for uh, students on campus. Uh, certainly, Grand Valley has some unique qualities to it because the main campus is in Allendale and their satellite campus is in Grand Rapids. So there's a large student population in Allendale for sure and a large student population in downtown Grand Rapids. And both communities have unique qualities and challenges. One of the things that we're, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today is if you've been with me before, we are going to, you're going to hear some of the same information about what resources are available, where they are, and some of the things that you need to be doing. But we really want to concentrate on those businesses that serve the student population and the surrounding area around the campuses to make sure that you're ready, willing, and able to do what we need to do. As students return, whether that's college or K through 12, these are huge milestones for us in the fight against COVID that we need to all be really aware of and avoid that complacency that some people are seeing or feeling out there as it relates to containing COVID. Because as COVID spreads in our communities, our, our numbers are not good and DHHS and the governor get in a position where they have to make very tough decisions. And certainly the governor has said and shown that she will do what it takes to protect Michigan lives. So this is a challenge, not necessarily because these are young people, but because of just the population that's going to congregate around a campus in housing, in classrooms, in those businesses that support the campus and the students. Uh, and we need to really be focused and make sure that we're doing that. We also need help from all of you that are watching today and participating to push this out to your fellow businesses to make sure that they're getting this information as well because you're all choosing to be here today but there are many businesses that either can't or won't participate in a webinar like this but they need to know that what they do impacts your business as well as our entire community one of the things that we hear when we're out there fighting the covid challenge and trying to work with businesses to make sure they're doing the right things is just find the bad actors now, with COVID, the challenge with what would be quote unquote a bad actor who are, isn't following the executive orders and the guidelines is that by the time that we may be flagged or we become aware of it, it's possible that they've already started that increase in community transmission, which is going to impact all of our businesses and all of our lives every day. I can tell you that we've had discussions around the state of Michigan, including Grand Valley, on things that they're doing to control campus life, classrooms, student populations, and otherwise, as it relates to those items that are under their purview, like campus housing, or classrooms, or student activities, or sports, as you've seen. And they are working very, very hard to make sure that they have the plans in place to deal with students coming back, as well as potential COVID cases, quarantine, isolating, and otherwise, but they really need a commitment from the business community too, because you need to see yourself as part of the solution and part of the plan to make sure that we're able to get students on campus and staying on campus throughout the school year the best that we can. We've already seen a lot of colleges moving to all online and that's based on the numbers that they're seeing and the challenges we face. And that's probably a good step in many of those communities where they've made that decision other students will be coming back to campus. So don't assume just because they're going online that there won't be students there and you don't have a role to play. And you have to think beyond just what we have to do. When we talk about guidelines and things that you need to be doing, think beyond that. We're gonna talk a little bit about how COVID spreads in those things so that you can understand the framework of the executive orders and guidelines and what these things mean and what you're trying to do. So think beyond what you have to do and start thinking about what you can do. And that might be in your own business, helping another business in your community or otherwise. We really have to challenge ourselves to take ownership of containing COVID based on the things that we can control. And that's ourselves and that's our businesses. That's how we work. That's how we go to class and otherwise. It's going to be on all of us to recognize that it's not just going to a restaurant. The restaurant itself isn't unsafe. It's that we're congregating. 
that we're getting together that we don't know who has the virus and we may be spreading around. So we have to think about that as it relates to the backyard barbecue or the birthday party or otherwise as we move forward as well. Now we're expanding this, the discussion today to include our friends from the Liquor Control Commission and the Fire Marshal to talk about some of those uh, other requirements that you have to follow. And don't forget to engage and participate in potential local actions that can be taken. Uh, you should always keep in mind that you should engage your local public health if you have questions about COVID and you can engage local public health if you have specific needs in your community that require some kind of order that's stronger than the executive orders. For example, some communities are considering or have adopted through their local public health a smaller gathering requirement for outdoor public spaces. Some communities have adopted ordinances that can help hold landlords, off-campus landlords, accountable for behaviors within those facilities. Some communities have hired their own security guards to take care of known congregation points. One was a particular lot where people tend to gather on weekends. And the things that you need to be doing in your business or workplace include making sure you have that preparedness and response plan, doing those daily health screenings of your employees, ensuring that all of your employees and customers are wearing the mask, following those limitations on sizes, posting signs and notices, and closing areas that you should be closing, like waiting areas and other places. And our whole goal here is to make a difference in our communities and make sure that we get open and stay open and keep our economy moving forward. As we look across Michigan, we know that we're just shy of about 90,000 confirmed cases. And in the Kent and Ottawa County regions, that's about 7,000 and 1,800 respectively. In the age group where this is most frequent right now is that 20 to 29 year old age group, which is certainly within the wheelhouse of the average college student age. And these are things that we need to think about as we're opening our place of business and, and trying to re-engage and stay engaged. In all of this science, all of the things that we've seen, there's a few things that have remained static. Now there's a 24 seven news cycle and there's all kinds of news and information about COVID. And we know it gets a little bit noisy, but there are a few things that have stayed absolutely the same since the beginning. That is that this disease primarily spreads through large respiratory droplets that we exhale when we breathe, when we cough, when we sneeze, they come out when we talk, yell or sing, and social distance really helps to mitigate the hazard or the risk of transmission because gravity, outdoor air, and those things help uh, the, the virus either fall to the ground or fall away without necessarily giving you a dosage large enough to get sick. When we cannot maintain that social distance, face coverings really help to control how far we can expel those large respiratory droplets and then good hygiene to make sure that we're not touching surfaces and then our eyes, nose, or mouth and contaminating ourselves that way. So what we know is that about 40% of those who have COVID may end up being asymptomatic. And a large percentage is also spread by those folks that are pre-symptomatic, meaning that they feel fine. They'll either never get sick or they're not sick yet. And it's believed that the facial coverings can cut transmission by about 70%. So you can picture from this chart here that when we had stay home, stay safe, our numbers dropped quickly because we had practically no chance of transmission when we are completely social distanced and we're not interacting. Our lowest possible transmission is when we're both wearing face coverings and maintaining that six feet of social distance. And we still have low chance of transmission when we're both wearing face coverings and it escalates up from there. So if we're wearing face coverings, we can really move forward with cutting the risk of transmission in our communities, recognizing that a lot of people that are spreading the virus won't get sick or don't know they're sick. And when we congregate, it really enhances the ability of that virus to jump around in our communities and move quickly. So if you're reopening and, and to operate safely, you really need to take some actions and that includes following the executive orders, making a good faith effort to adhere to the guidelines that are posted, training your employees on health and safety practices, and a few more things that we'll cover in a minute. There are eight kind of key steps that you can take to keep your workers and customers safe. And these are engineering or administrative controls and other tools. So when we say the word engineering controls, we mean those sort of more permanent physical things. So that could be those plastic barriers, 
changes to your ventilation system, things like that that are going to stick with us for a long time. Administrative controls are things that you can manage administratively or through management, and that includes access controls. When we think about access controls, if your business is not open to the public, those are those health screenings of employees, limiting guests and visitors to uh, those people that you can control coming in and out. If you're open to the public, those access controls it can include the health screenings for employees, the postings on the sign, asking customers to stay away if they're sick, doing curbside service, those types of things. Certainly distancing, making sure that if you're a restaurant, that your tables are six feet apart, that you are maintaining as much distance as possible between not only your workers, but customers. Sanitation by making sure that you are cleaning regularly and you're doing that deep cleaning if you happen to have a, a positive COVID case. Getting all of your employees to practice good hygiene, making sure they're washing regularly and using hand sanitizer if they can't wash regularly. Providing those face masks and other PPE that employees will need to make sure that they're safe and contained from COVID and requiring your customers to wear those face coverings because that is their version of not necessarily personal protective equipment, but helping to cut the transmission of COVID within your environment. What you'll do for those positive case protocols, which include notifying local public health, and then a possible facility closure for a certain amount of time if you have positive COVID cases to make sure that you're doing that deep cleaning and getting rid of the potential virus within that space. For those bars and restaurant industries, one of the many tools that we have available are videos and fact sheets on our COVID workplace safety website, which I'll mention in just a minute. And we're just going to go ahead and show you this tool that we have here, which is going to run through really quickly uh, some of the guidelines that are required for bars and restaurants. For food service employees and their employers, there are new ways to work safely to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Designate one or more worksite supervisors to implement, monitor, and report on the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan. Develop daily entry screening protocol for employees and contractors. Display a door or sidewalk sign with the services available, instructions for pickup, and hours of operation. Reserve parking spaces near the front door for curbside pickup only. Limit capacity to 50% of normal seating. Require six feet of separation between parties or groups at different tables or bar tops. Close waiting areas and ask customers to wait in cars for a call when their table is ready. Create or post communication materials for customers, including instructing customers to wear a face covering or mask until they are seated. Close self-serve food or drink options, such as buffets, salad bars, and drink stations. Require hosts and servers to wear face coverings. Food preparers should wear face coverings and gloves in the kitchen area when handling food. Install physical barriers such as sneeze guards and partitions at cash registers, bars, host stands, and other areas where maintaining physical distance of six feet is difficult. Limit number of employees in shared spaces. Provide physical guides such as tape on floors or sidewalks and signage on walls to ensure that customers remain at least six feet apart in any lines. And wherever you work, here are some guidelines and safety precautions for you to do your part in reducing the spread of COVID-19. Limit close contact with others by maintaining a distance of at least six feet when possible. Minimize handling of cash, credit cards, and mobile devices, and wash or sanitize your hands after handling. Practice routine cleaning and disinfection of frequently touched surfaces and tools. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. And be sure to follow these safety precautions. Wear face coverings or masks. Check for symptoms that often include fever or abnormal cough or shortness of breath. Stay home if you are sick or have been in close contact with someone who is sick. Report your diagnostic test results and exposures to your employer and participate honestly and urgently in workplace safety training. For additional resources, 
visit michigan.gov slash myosha. So there are other regulations and requirements too, depending on where you're at in the state. And we have a nice link uh, and you can find more info at the Michigan Safe Start map on what can and cannot be open. Uh, part of the places in, uh, in your establishment that you're gonna be thinking about closing or not thinking about that are gonna be closed, include those things like dance floors, performance venues or otherwise. You just got to really focus in on those things that I mentioned about congregating and what these the science of this is with the six feet of social distancing, the face coverage and the hygiene. All of those things are really structured around those concepts and think about where you are in the things that you're doing. But there are additional regulations that we do want to discuss today and, and have time on the FAQ for. Uh, and that might include the indoor service restrictions at bars that earn more than 70% of their gross receipts from alcohol sales and otherwise. But first we'll hear from Kevin Selmeyer, the fire marshal in the Bureau of Fire Services. Hey, Sean, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me on. And uh, it's great to uh, be talking to the folks in West Michigan. Uh, that's where the fire marshal lives. I live in the West Michigan area. I'm very familiar with uh, colleges and universities, having worked for the Grand Rapids Fire Department for uh, almost 31 years. Um, with that being said, um, we want to talk today about um, the Bureau of Fire Services at the state of Michigan, and then also the authority that the state fire marshal has under Public Act 207 of 1941. Um, most of the inspections that we do on a regular basis um, in the school setting include college and university classrooms, and those are um, instructional facilities is the way it's classified or classrooms. And we actually, when the buildings are being remodeled or the buildings are being built, we actually um, have inspectors who are part of that process as we give approval for classroom space. And then also in the dormitories. Um, one of the things that we wanna, that we're trying to express through this program is the uh, fact that um, trying to keep groups from congregating even in the dorms and in the classrooms. Um, an example of uh, something that's been recently done is Public Act 159, excuse me, Executive Order 159 um, that was put out by the governor, which actually allows college and universities to use classroom space that hadn't been approved previously without having to go through the full approval process. There is a process in place where colleges and universities have to um, complete really a single page form. It's letting us know what buildings, what our spaces are going to use it as classrooms. And the whole idea of doing this is to obtain social distancing, um, to take folks that uh, maybe a classroom that would hold 50 students and break them up into smaller groups and move them to other spaces around the college. So if you uh, have any questions about that, uh, the Bureau of Fire Services, our um, plan review division um, definitely can answer that. We also have it on our website uh, at the Bureau of Fire Services to go over how you get classroom space approved. The other part that the Bureau of Fire Services, the State Fire Marshal regulates is our places of assembly. And this is kind of a concern, and that's part of the conversation today too, is, is that when we bring um, these students back to school, um, you know, they're going to want to go out to restaurants, to bars, um, those type of situations. Um, there again, the restaurant bars, um, we mentioned earlier, 70% of the sale in alcohol, the bars are closed, but you still have restaurants that do have a bar. You still have places where people are going to congregate. Um, one of the things that um, in the video they talked about getting six feet apart. Um, one of the questions that came up yesterday that we talked about was many times you can't, um, you know, a restaurant or a uh, will call us and they'll say, hey, what's 50% of our capacity? And that's a it's a pretty tough question to answer just uh, by saying it's, it's this much area. It has to do with how big the bar itself is, that how much room that takes up in the space, and also the size of your tables. So the idea here is we're trying to get six feet between the tables, and we're trying to increase that space that was clearly shown in the video to make it safer. Sean, can I ask you to go to the next slide, please? The other thing that we, we want to talk about is, um, you know, we can help you with how to calculate capacity. So one of the things that um, in many cases, um, you know, it's going to, uh, you know, us, maybe you showing us pictures, um, we can help you with that uh, calculation, or a lot of times reaching out to your local fire department um, that have fire um, inspectors who can help you with that also. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is, is that if a, a, a venue is over capacity um, within the fire code, 
Um, typically, we have the ability to um, limit how many folks can be in a venue and under the executive orders, it definitely has reduced those numbers. So one of the things that um, you know we want to share is that uh, businesses, um, restaurants, it is their job to limit the amount of people going into a venue. That's no different on any other time uh, when a venue is open. And that's kind of where uh, the capacity part comes into the fire code. So we 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 can get involved um, with the local fire departments um, to help address capacity issues if they're over capacity um, so that we can educate and uh, make sure that this isn't happening on a regular basis. Um, we also, the Bureau of Fire Services, State Fire Marshal, we want to work with our partners and local government. Um, Sean um, hit on it earlier in the in the conversation. He talked about some communities have ordinances. Um, one of the questions that came up yesterday, and it's came up on other calls, um, how do we deal with uh, large gatherings of students off campus? And many cases for a community, the best way to deal with that may be an ordinance that's already in place. It could be for sound or it could be for uh, disturbing the peace and those type of things. So we're, we want to work together. We want to work with the locals. And uh, I'm sharing with you on this slide uh, my cell phone number. And uh, the idea here is that if you need to reach out um, through even through your local uh, you know, fire department, uh, law enforcement agencies in the area. I think that's one part that we hit on yesterday and I need to make sure we hit on today. In some communities, um, you're not always going to have a dedicated police department and many times it will be the sheriff's department. So these are good conversations you wanna have a, ahead of time. It's that planning part of it to realize that some of these issues are probably going to pop up and what's the plan with how we are going to deal with them. That's what we're really trying to do here today, we're trying to educate, and be part of developing relationships so that as we move into going back to school, we can do it safely. Sean, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, Kevin. And if uh, hopefully Barb's uh, technical difficulties were corrected, we have uh, Barb Sebastian with the Liquor Control Commission. Yes, they were, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for having me here. I'm with the Michigan Liquor Control Commission in the Enforcement Division. Uh, my agency is responsible for enforcing the liquor laws and rules, as well as the executive orders. Uh, we work with businesses and try to educate as much as possible. We have been checking businesses relative to violations, uh, including the executive orders recently. But we do try to educate first if we find that uh, businesses are not taking it seriously and that the health and safety and welfare of the public is affected. We will take stiffer action, but that's not our goal. Um, we also work with local police departments. We partner with them on various things. We also provide money to them so that they can enforce our laws and rules and the executive orders and assist the community in those ways as well. We also provide education to licensees so that they know what's expected of them under our laws and rules. And we feel that's very important. Uh, I do have some information for you on the slide here. Uh, contact information for the Liquor Control Commission's website. There's a lot of great resources there. We have information about COVID, about reopening resources, ways you can do it safely, new permits and laws that have happened recently relative to the COVID situation that might help you out. If you need anything from me as one of our, the enforcement staff, my email address is there and you're welcome to contact me and I'd be happy to assist you. A couple other quick things I just wanted to throw in. Uh, the Liquor Commission is committed to helping businesses getting open, staying open, doing it safely and doing it legally. Unfortunately, we know that the indoor bar situation has been uniquely suited to spread coronavirus. Uh, we're finding out that a lot of the human behavior is the problem. People loudly talking to each other, getting close to each other to talk over the music, crowding each other, dancing, drinking alcohol that lowers inhibitions and affects good judgment. All those things are at play here. We're seeing a rise in the number of cases of young people 20 to 29, and that age group is being represented more strongly now than they have been, almost as close as the 60 to 69 age group. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen, that those numbers go the opposite direction. There are less people getting affected. Please keep in mind that it's important that your staff and your guests wear masks. There are exceptions for when they're eating or drinking, they're allowed to remove their masks. There's also an allowance for you as a business owner to ask them to remove the mask in order to identify them to make sure they're of legal age and perhaps to, to be able to monitor their intoxication level. That is something within your authority. We encourage you to do that when it's necessary. Uh, also wanted to mention that dancing right now is suspended, is not allowed 
for your customers to be dancing. So please don't allow that. That's another way that this can spread and it uh, creates more risk for your customers and your staff. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, oh, I did want to mention too, we're getting a lot of questions about the 70% thing. If it helps the businesses out there, basically you are restricted from having indoor service if more than 70% of your gross receipts come from the sale of alcohol. Just to let you know, we're going by the, the common definition of gross receipts. This would be something that you typically report on your tax return. If you have any questions, you can talk to your CPA or other professional who may be able to guide you to answer whether those things are included in your gross receipts and whether you can comply. I'll be able to answer questions later in this uh, webinar as well about that issue. Thank you, Sean. Sorry about the phone, can't shut it off. Thanks, Barb, I appreciate that. I figured it was one of your West Michigan family members watching the webinar saying, hey, I just heard you on the webinar. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, uh, great information there, Barb and, and Kevin. Uh, it's going to be great for our FAQ as well. And just, uh, just know that if you go to michigan.gov forward slash COVID workplace safety, we have a whole suite of tools available for you as you get open and stay open with guidelines created by MIOSHA that follow the executive orders as well as the CDC requirements for different types of workplaces. Uh, these are very good and very available. We have reopening checklists and fact sheets there for every type of industry. Um, all of the guidelines we have, we have uh, a specific guideline for every industry that's been named in an executive order. And if you haven't been named, we have general industry guidelines which apply across the board. Uh, those are available there. We have posters uh, that you can use for some of those posting requirements that you're expected to meet. We have uh, a few examples of our posters and the posters go beyond just the no mask, no entry, but you can see there the waiting area closed. Please wait in your car. We have posters about your size limitations and other things. Uh, definitely check those out. There are other links on that website too that I'll touch on briefly, including the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. They've developed a Peer Michigan Business Connect platform where you can go and find the PPE and other things that you need. These include phys physical barriers, uh, hand sanitizer, you name it, they have it there. If you are manufacturing that, I know that a lot of distillers switched over to making sanitizer. You can connect your business to other businesses through that platform as well. So make sure you check that out. The My Symptoms app was created by DHHS and the University of Michigan. One of the requirements for every workplace is that you're conducting a daily health screening. And this includes a series of questions designed to identify and flag potential symptoms of COVID. A uh, few industries, manufacturing, meat packaging, and casinos have to also do a temperature check. It's uh, if possible, or if, if you can do it in other types of settings, but this symptoms app was designed to comply with the health screening requirements. It's very simple, it's free. An employer can go to the My Symptoms app link, set up an employer account. You'll get a specific employer ID number that you share with your employees. They register their account using that number and then every day they will get they can do a series of questions on their smartphone, tablet, desktop, you name it. That will identify if they're flagged for COVID and that will satisfy as long as you're checking their phone to show that they're good. And then next week I think we'll be launching a, a, a real time portal that you can use to make sure that they're taking and passing the health screening. If they flag for symptoms of COVID, it will give them uh, a orange warning screen, tell them to call their health care professional as well as their supervisor, and you can designate who that report goes to. We also have links to the Safe Start info as well as the DHHS, excuse me, Mask Up Michigan program, which has a lot of information and posters and other things that you can use there as well. And don't forget to check the Kent County and Ottawa County for the Allendale campus uh, health departments uh, websites because they have great info there for getting back to work uh, health check programs. Some public health departments have their own screening requirements too. So you definitely want to check there to make sure that they don't have more strict requirements than we have in the executive orders because they can do that. Myosha also created a hotline early on in the crisis. The team over there did a great job. This rings directly into Myosha, right to the, the experts at Myosha on workplace safety and health and it's 855-SAFE-C19. 
The, an employer can use that for any type of question regarding the workplace as well as employees. If your employer, we have a great consultation program, the folks at Myosha have, and uh, if necessary, they can get you over to the consultation team. If you're an employee and you have a concern, and if it's necessary, they can get you over to a complaint. And it's a wonderful system. It's about a 15 second, you heard that right, 15 second wait time. And the average call is about five minutes, depending on what kind of issue you're trying to discuss. Make sure you're taking advantage of that as you're restarting and thinking through things that you could or should be doing in your workplace. And with that, we'll transition over to the question and answer portion of our program. And here we go. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm Kamara and I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so if you see in the bottom right hand corner, you should be able to ask questions for our panelists today. With that, our first question for you, Sean, is what do you think will be the biggest obstacle or struggle that businesses in college towns will face as students come back to campus? Um, I think they'll have a lot of them. I think in a college town specifically, uh, typically the campus is really the economic engine, right? So the businesses that surround the campus are trying to drive their annual profits based on that school year and they're going to have a lot of customers that they're trying to serve and in the COVID environment they're going to have to restructure in a way that they can't fit everybody inside like they used to they can't have the dance floors and the performance venues open uh, they may need to think about additional seating think about those lines outside we know we had a high profile example out of lansing where you know there was a lot of people inside but you know the news showed another 100 people standing outside all within a very close proximity to each other so think about how you do that consider maybe you provide tickets to your establishment it doesn't necessarily mean they have to pay for the tickets but you'll be able to control how many people are coming in at any given time maybe you consider going to reservations to really try to control that uh, but uh, the reason we're focusing on college towns is just sheer volume you're going to have like grand valley out in allendale i think you're going to have somewhere around potentially depending on how many come back sooner rather than later, because some are pushing uh, to a more later start for more students, but potentially 20,000 plus people congregating on that campus and that community in a short amount of time. So it's just a lot of people and the, the businesses need to be prepared to limit and contain uh, how they operate to make sure that they are keeping that social distance, requiring those face coverings and keeping people safe and keeping us open. Thanks, those are all great points. The next question we have is, if there is any employee who is waiting for test results, are we required to notify other employees that an employee has been exposed but not determined positive yet? Uh, so this, obviously this question is coming up a lot, depending on the testing capacity where you are and who you're using. Tests can take from 24 to 48 hours and we're, we've heard some five to seven days. Obviously, five to seven days makes the testing regimen a challenge. But if that employee has been exposed in a, and is awaiting test results, part of what you're going to do with your other staff is make a determination on exposure. So first and foremost, was that employee exhibiting symptoms? If they were exhi exhibiting symptoms and that's why they're getting tested, you're going to want to find and identify those employees that had close contact. Close contacts defined as being within six feet for 15 minutes or more. So you're going to want to do that contract contact tracing within your workplace to see if that's the case. If this is somebody that hadn't come back to the workplace and for some reason they're getting tested because they were exposed elsewhere, then uh, if there's no exposure to employees, there's nothing to tell your employees. So uh, it's going to depend on the circumstances of why they're getting that test and if they're exhibiting symptoms. Our next question talks about masks. Um, what should I do if people are not compliant with masks? Do we have a list of compliant masks somewhere? Um, the type of mask, so if, if customers, certainly for employees, if you're in a public space, a bar, a restaurant, anywhere where the public can come in, they need to be wearing that face covering at all times. We know that includes cooks in the kitchen and everything else, right? Uh, if they're preparing food, they have to be wearing that face covering. And we know and we hear you that it's hot and you don't always like to wear them. And, and sometimes it, it gets aggravating, but that's the environment we're in and that's what we need to do. 
customers coming in need to be wearing the face covering and you can deny service if they are not. Now, if they're medically unable or they say they are, you should engage in a dialogue with them about a potential accommodation. And that could be include doing curbside service. It could be uh, potentially a face visor and separating them. If you're a restaurant, uh, you know, finding some mechanism to get them to a table. We don't want to really discriminate against people that are medically unable to tolerate the face covering, but we do need to uh, make sure that people are wearing them. So uh, offer the accommodation, find an accommodation, and it could be that curbside or takeout service. And as far as the type, uh, we're relying on the CDC guidance to tell us kind of what types. We know that cloth face coverings are the recommend. We did see some news today about the ones with the valves from the CDC, not recommending those because you can still get droplets coming out of them. And uh, we will do our best to keep up with that. I would definitely check DHHS and CDC on, on what they're recommending for the type of mask. Thanks, John. Um, our next question is again about testing. We have an employee that tested positive according to our local health department. As long as he has been off work for 14 days, will he need to be tested again prior to returning to work to prevent spread? Uh, not necessarily. If he doesn't develop symptoms, and I said he because they said he, but if the person doesn't develop symptoms, uh, there's not. it's not necessary that they retest, but I would definitely check the CDC guidance on the testing protocol. They've changed that recently, recognizing that uh, testing capacity is limited. They've shortened the 14 days to 10 because uh, the, the transmission period is is changing with the science. So definitely check the testing protocol at CDC for the latest guidance. Uh, don't watch this video three months from now and assume that's still the same answer, uh, but you know, definitely follow those protocols. Uh, this next question we have is about uh, conversations that campuses can have with different groups. So this one's specific about, um, are there conversations being had with frats and sororities? How should we make sure that they are spreading the word about these guidelines? Uh, having been engaged in these discussions all over the state, I can absolutely tell you that the uh, university presidents, safety folks, and others are absolutely reaching out to the frat fraternities and sororities and other student leadership groups to have these discussions on things that they need to be doing. They're looking and changing their codes of conduct to you know, try to get more compliance with the requirements of the executive orders and face coverings and otherwise. So those conversations are happening. If you are one of those folks in one of those groups, engage with your university, engage with us, You know, be a leader out there, take ownership over this, make sure that you're helping to keep things open. Um, our next one is about capacity. Why are banquet centers prohibited from hosting wedding receptions at 50% capacity when restaurants are permitted to do so? Um, a restaurant cannot host a wedding reception. Any event with 10 or more people that's indoor that are not from the same household cannot be held. The venue they're in does not make a difference. So you can't, you know, the banquet center can't uh, uh, can't host them and they can't call the local restaurant and say, I wanna bring 15 people with me, can I do that? The answer is no, you can't have those. Uh, following that question is also about capacity. Are there limits or rules for outdoor waiting lines? So uh, as the video showed, so if you have an outdoor line, you should be putting markers out there to show what six feet of separation is. I would encourage you to consider, like I mentioned earlier, whether it's ticketing or reservations or otherwise, you know, working to make sure you mitigate that, depending on what type of establishment you are. Um, we recognize that, uh, it, me included, normally on a, a Friday night around 6 p.m., you're thinking about some food and you just stop in somewhere. And we're in a time now with COVID where we need to be a little bit more formal about how many people are, are showing up somewhere at one time. So at, the, at, at a minimum, you need to be placing those markings outside to make sure you keep that six feet of separation. If you're a restaurant, you need to have your waiting area closed and a note, uh, a sign on the door saying that, you know, please wait in your car, we'll come and let you know. Uh, a lot of places have that little vibrating thing they give you. You know, they can take that and sit in their car and wait for you to buzz them in. Hey, Sean. 
Yeah. I've also been told, uh, I've been I've been hearing some bar owners commenting that there are some really good phone apps out there that they can use to manage lines, similar to you said, uh, where people have to maybe sign in and uh, the phone app will tell them when to return to the establishment or something like that. But they might want to check with other bar owners who might be using these already, because it sounds like there's some good ones out there. Thanks, Barb, for that um, extra tip. Our next question um, is related to in person learning. So how can classrooms have more than a 10 person indoor limit? Is there an exemption for rules or schools? Kevin, do you want that one? You're on mute. I think that one of the things that as the school districts are, are coming back to school, I think this is probably more for the K through 12. Those are some of the decisions that are making that are being made. Um, so at Sean, like uh, yourself, I've also been involved in some conversations and they're talking about how to limit the number of students in a, in a classroom. Um, also talking about social distancing and mask wearing. So um, Sean, I think you you hit it. Um, straight on the head here a few minutes ago when you said that, you know, if you're watching this if a few months from now, it might be a different answer, right? As we continue to learn more and it evolves. I think as we get closer to um, the schools going back into session and actually going into a classroom, I think you'll continue to see some of this stuff evolve also. Um, but currently it's it's 10, 10 people inside of an establishment. And uh, I know that there's some talk of uh, ways that they're going to address classrooms in the future too. Perfect, thanks Kevin. Uh, this next question is a little bit long. It's kind of like one of those scenario questions, so I'll do my best and if you need me to repeat, just let me know. We will be having our move in day scheduled over two days in each floor around 23 apartments on each floor will be scheduled at certain times broken up um, into one and a half hour increments. We have multiple rooms that the residents will be walking through to check for different stations. Are we allowed to have 10 people in each room? What if we need or what if move in stations or outdoor deck? Can we have more than 10 people outside? Can we have more than enough space to maintain six feet? Uh, if so, uh, limitations indoors are 10 or less, not from the same household for an event or a function. If you are moving in and you're checking those rooms to see what's happening, uh, you should keep that under 10. If you're outdoors, the limit right now is 100 people, provided you can maintain that six feet of social distance. So if you have that deck, uh, and I'm answering this question, assuming it's not, you know, like intended to be a big gathering, but if you're using that deck and uh, you can maintain that six feet of social distance, uh, you can you can have more than 10 people outside. Keep in mind that even outdoors now, if you cannot maintain six feet, you need to be wearing those face coverings. Sean, can I uh, answer this yeah, a little bit please. too? Uh, I've got a son who's getting ready to go off to college as a freshman here in the next few weeks. And uh, I know with his school, um, they are actually going with, he has a scheduled time that he is to move in. And he is also limited that he can only bring two people with him. So I think that's some of the things that some of the universities and colleges are doing. And I think that's part of the planning that we're talking about here. It's those relationships, but but also to plan, how do you control this? Uh, um, you know, very similar to having a reservation, having an appointment, and then, um, you know, I, I get it. It's a, a tough time, right, for some of these kids leaving home for the first time, and uh, they want to have their whole family come, but a lot of colleges and universities are limiting how many people they can bring with them. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, and this will be our last question today. Um, can you talk more about the enforcement? Are there checks to make sure businesses are compliant? Uh, yeah, there are several ways that we are doing that. And uh, so I'll start from a workplace safety perspective. And I think uh, Kevin and Barb can certainly talk from uh, fire inspection and, and liquor control. But uh, from the workplace safety, we have uh, several things going. One is we have a state emphasis program that Myosha is running right now, focused on bars, restaurants, and retail that is spot inspections not underhanded they'll let you know they're there but there's spot inspections 
for compliance with the executive orders, and that includes having a preparedness and response plan, doing the health screenings, postings, and wearing face coverings and other things that you're supposed to be doing. Uh, they will certainly work with you and consult with you. Our goal is not to find one little thing and get you in trouble. It's to educate and make sure that you're doing what you need to be doing. If they do fi find a flagrant violator, um, they can issue potentially issue a citation for up to seven thousand dollars. So uh, you definitely want to make sure that you're looking and watching. As Kevin mentioned earlier and Barb mentioned, our goal is to educate. It's the novel coronavirus, meaning it's new. Uh, we understand that not everybody and not even us on the call with you know everything that we could or should be doing and it will change as the science develops. So um, our goal is to educate and that's why all these tools are available. That's why we're here. You can call us. You can use the hotline. You can do all these things to try to make sure that you're you're keeping up. Uh, but there are certainly uh, in local public health. I know I'll speak for them because we communicate with them regularly too. They are out and about too, making sure that places and establishments are complying with the executive orders as well. But I'll turn it over to Kevin if he wants to touch base on the uh, fire. Sean, thanks. Um, we've actually been going all the way back to March. Our staff, our fire inspectors have been doing some uh, random stops. And, and one of the things that we've been doing with the random stops is, is and many times we see folks that are doing really good things. We also want to share with folks that they are doing good things. Um, if we see, um, you know, early on we saw especially takeout, you know, they were they were limited on how many people they could have in to pick up their takeout um, earlier on. We would stop and we would educate and talk with folks. And uh, same thing with seeing lines outside and different things like that. So our, our, uh, our inspectors are available. They are out and they are uh, checking in on situations. And, and, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do, too, is uh, really to praise the people who are doing it right. And I think that's one of the values of even having this webinar today. We're trying to share with uh, folks what some of the good things that are are out there so that we can keep things open and keep things moving. So. Thank you both. Um, that's all we had for the Q&A. Hang, hang on, Kamara. Did uh, Barb, did I'm you have? I'm jump on this one too, or they'll think I'm <laughs> trying to skip on this one. Uh, just so I know, the Liquor Commission is out there checking places too, and we've been doing that like the Bureau of Fire Safety since the beginning of this. I hate to admit that uh, every time an executive order comes out, uh, we get calls immediately from people, a variety of people uh, complaining that someone uh, who has a liquor license is not in compliance. We do take this very seriously, so we're checking all those things out. We try to educate first. Uh, our investigators have a couple tools in their bag. They can warn people verbally. They can issue a written warning. They can actually submit a violation. Uh, we're trying to uh, educate first, take stiffer action if the situations are egregious or if li if licensees are just uh, disregarding them entirely. Um, but we do want to work with our businesses. We want to be available for questions and, and guidance. Uh, so please take advantage of that if you're a business out there and you have questions for us. Thank you all. Um, that's all we had for Q&A. So Sean, if you had anything else you wanted to add before we close out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Kevin and Barb again for being with us today. Uh, this is it's wonderful having you along to talk about those other pieces that fall outside of sort of the workplace safety spectrum and be able to answer questions. And I you know, we all said we're here to educate, to work with you, to try to do things right. Uh, that is absolutely the case. We know in our own checks that uh, and probably for all of us, I'll speak for all of us that, you know, 80, 90 percent of everybody we talk to is doing a lot, maybe a couple of tweaks here and there. They're doing the best they can. They're making a good faith effort. And uh, we do also want to uh, thank you for everything that you're trying to do out there. We just uh, put these together to really recognize that, you know, COVID is with us. Uh, whether we're sick of it or not, we're, we're no pun intended, we're, we're, it's with us for uh, some time and we need to really make sure that we're sticking with those things that have stayed static, that social distance, the face coverings and the good hygiene to make sure when we're looking at our workplaces, when we're looking at our communities, we're finding ways and ideas to really handle the load of people that are, are around. We like to do things, so we need to think about those lines, we need to think about the inside. We need to think about our own behaviors and take control of our actions and make sure that we're 
doing our best to make sure we contain COVID because this is an age group, the college student population is an age group where we're seeing the virus really start to spread. And while uh, we do know that there have been fatalities across all age groups, maybe this population doesn't get it as severely, they still promote that community transmission. And that puts us in a position where uh, we either need to back, go backwards on the stages of reopening, or we can try to keep moving forward. And I think for all of us uh, and all of those listening and watching, uh, we want to move forward. And these tools are what are gonna get us there, making sure we're doing the face coverings and everything else. So uh, this, you can't, under stress how big this milestone is for the state of Michigan in our fight against COVID. College students coming back in K through 12 because we're bringing a lot of people potentially together and that's where we really see COVID get its foothold in our communities and take off. So, but to keep in mind, think about this as it relates to your family gathering and everything else too. You really need to think about how this thing spreads because as I mentioned, it's not that it's in the restaurant, it's that we're in the restaurant. So we really got to think about how this thing is spreading and, and what we need to do in our own lives. And that includes that off-campus housing, those parties that everybody's familiar with, those large gatherings that people want to have, uh, and making sure that we're not doing those things right now because you know we want to move to blue, we want to move this Michigan forward. And to do that, we have to get and keep our numbers down. And, uh, you know, after the fourth, we saw a, a sharp increase in the numbers in Michigan. We're starting to trend back down. Part of that's because of more social distancing. Part of that's because of the face coverings and we have to keep it moving forward. So keep coming up with good ideas. Uh, some of the suggestions we made are based on our conversations with some of you that are doing these things already. And, and uh, we're going to keep being out there. We're available. Make sure you take advantage of us and, you know, let's do everything we can, not just what we must, but everything we can to get open and stay open. I appreciate your time and make sure you help us push this out because, like I said, you've chosen to be here. Not everybody has. Make sure they have this information, too. But let's do everything we can to get open and stay open.